Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Scott Luton here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. We have an outstanding conversation teed up as we're going to be talking with a business leader doing big things out in the industry, especially in the chemicals industry. So with that said, we're going to dive right in. I'm going to introduce our featured guest here today. Our guest has a deep background in chemical and biochemical engineering, well above my pay grade, let me tell you as well as over 20 years of experience in strategic supply chain innovation. He specializes in global supply chain network design, amongst many other things. And we might just talk about what he does when he puts his inventor hat on that he wears from time to time. So with that said, let's welcome in the Vice President of Supply Chain Services at CLX Logistics, Dale McClung. Dale, how you doing? Hey, Scott. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. You bet. And I got to go back to your chemical and biochemical engineering background. Sure. I knew when I was in college, that was too much math, amongst other things, for my intellect. So uh, you've put it to work in across the uh, global business landscape, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I've been in the chemical industry my whole professional uh, career. Really? Okay. We're going to dive into that. We're going to dive into what really makes chemical supply chain, logistics, the chemical industry unique and and challenging at times. So you got to look for those good partners. But where I want to start with, Dale, we're mm-hmm. talking pre-show a little bit because you've got two degrees from the West Virginia University Institute of Technology. So I'm assuming, is it right that you grew up in that part of the world? Yeah, yeah I sure did. I grew up in Southern West Virginia on a horse farm. Really? What's the name of the town? The small town is named Quinwood. The town down the street is a little more popular as Raynell. And it's, yeah, it's a very, very small town. Okay, Quinwood. And a horse farm, no less. I guess, were you working long days as a kid on a horse farm? You do everything on the farm, right? And we had Tennessee walkers. So between the horses, the upkeep, the hay fields, and everything else, it, it consumed the biggest part of your day, yeah. Oh, it's a lot of work. When I was a kid... Once or twice, my uncle had a couple of horses. And folks may think that since hay is so light, they may think like hay, hay bales are light. But you stack a put you, know, you stack a bunch of hay bales in a barn, you're good to sleep for a few days, huh? You sure are. And we never could afford those big round balers. So we were we were working with the short square bar- bales. And no, they're not light. <laughs> mm. Quinwood, West Virginia. All right. One more question about where you grew up. Food. I love talking food, especially regionally. What's one food dish that may be more prevalent in that, you know, in, in your hometown that you really miss these days? Yeah, um, I, I'll give you two. One on the farm, the prevalent food on the farm is brown beans and cornbread. Okay. Right. Brown <laughs> beans and cornbread. That's it. Maybe you had it for lunch and then you had it, had it for dinner and it tasted good. Mom knew how to fix it. Now, we got a special treat. There was a small, for lack of a better term, a beer joint, a tavern down the road, and they made the best hot dogs Mm. I've ever tasted. They were so greasy. They had the, you got two paper bags and a piece of wax paper, and you were lucky to get home before the grease got all the way through all of that and onto the car seat. Oh, those sound like world-class hot dogs to me. They were. You had me at hot. You had me at hot. I'll tell you what. All right. So let's talk about this. I hate to leave the food subjects. I think there's so much more we could talk about, but we got a lot more to get to. And I want to start with patent, this big patent mm-hmm. that you have pending that I think is going to be helpful in terms of improving forecasting. What can you share with us about that? Yeah, yeah. So it is a, a pretty novel approach to demand forecasting, and it uses a couple of things, spectral analysis, so in the optics realm, and waveform analysis in the sound waveforms. Yeah. The, the idea is that you map data to acoustic and optical realms 
And then you use the tools that they use every day in those two areas, you know, noise cancellation, image clarification, to forecast, to cr- basically create a better forecasting engine. And what we found is you're not really forecasting the data as so much as you're forecasting the person creating the data. That is, that's the interesting part. That's fascinating. I cannot yeah. wait. So is there a time frame associated where you'll be able to really lay it out to our audience? When will it be official? Yeah. So we're, ha- we're hoping to, to make some pretty big strides next year in the development. It's still pretty embryonic, but promising, very promising. And start to get a little bit more of a real world application later in next year. Okay. Spectral analysis and waveform analysis in terms yeah. of you leveraging those to improve demand forecasting. And I love how you put it. Beyond the numbers, the really yeah. forecasting the people behind the data. I love that. Yeah. All right. We're going to stay tuned on that on the edge of our chair because I want to bring y'all back and we'll talk more when it becomes official perhaps next year. So as we've established, you've been in the industry for quite some time. It, Dale, if you've listened to any of our shows, we've got this two-decade rule we try not to break, right? So we don't age ourselves. <laughs> but that, needless to say, you've seen a ton of change and evolution during your time in the industry. So I want to ask you this. Because we do, we know, like everything else, you know, the craft supply chain management continues to evolve. You know, I would argue not only is it here in 2023, not what it was 10 years ago, but it's hardly what it was maybe even two years ago. So what is one skill set in your view that the modern supply chain practitioner must embrace? I think the skill set that confines data and communications. So you have to be a good analyst that it can't stop there. You have to communicate well with the people you're working with, and you have to apply a real world aspect to the analysis. In our world, the analysis is the easy first step. Mm. The work comes in the so what, now what question that comes out of that analysis. Dale, yeah, well, well said. The anal- and I like how you put the analysis is the easy part. The tougher part is convincing the hearts and minds of yeah. folks across the board on the team and the C-suite of what the analysis is really telling us and what we should do based on what it's telling us. Would you agree? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay. So another thing I want to ask you about uh, before we get into some of the cool things you are doing at CLX Logistics is you and I both... Who knows? We could be third cousins. We've established some of the things we love. We both love, like good hot dogs. But (laughs) we're also big, very passionate, I think, both of us, about the lean mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And the lean continuous improvement methodology. So throughout much of your career, based on the homework we've done, be it at Bayer Material Science or now at CLX, you know, tried and true improvement mindsets like lean have been a big part of your work. And it goes without saying, of course, many of these things have been around, like Lean's been around for decades. But would you think, would you agree, rather, that they're more relevant today than perhaps ever before due to how we're all trying to manage change and complexity and surprises and a lot more, so much so here today? Yeah, I I totally agree with you. And then the the thing that Lean does most for me and the team here, and in my experience, is it brings structure. It brings a structured approach to uh, answering very difficult questions most of the time, a root cause analysis. How do we map a complex process and even attempt to look at removing waste and inefficiencies? And how do we go about change management? And, you know, what's a structured approach to that? To me, those lean tools, lean methodologies and lean approach are, are very powerful in those areas. Yeah, well said. And the, the structure. I mean, when I think, when I'm thinking through as you're, you're sharing, as we are all going through some degree based on where you are, some degree of uncertainty, right? And when you're doing that, especially when the stakes are so big, you really look for that structure, that foundation that you can anchor yourself to as you deal with everything else that's so fluid. So that's very, very well put. And I love how you dropped uh, like a lean guru would. Your root cause analysis, the value stream mapping, the waste. Because, yeah. you know, one last thought here. This just came up in, in a couple of shows in the last few weeks. Lean really has gotten a bad rap because it's been misused and mislabeled and misapplied through so many different organizations who wanted to do things that were not true lean 
things to do, but they kind of put that banner over it. Have you seen some of that, Dale? Yeah, yeah. In my experience, there's hardly ever one silver bullet. Mm. Lean is not a silver bullet. It's a very powerful tool that if combined with other tools, it could be a silver bullet. But, you know, there's not one software package that's a silver bullet. So people, I think, put too much stock in silver bullets and then they get disappointed. Mm. It's the people matching the, you know, the talent of the people and the experience matching the tool sets that brings the most value. Yeah, well said. And folks out there listening or watching, that's what you want to hear from the gurus and the SMEs you turn to. If anyone's sending you down to a one singular option, kick the tires on that because it, 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 it's got to fit. Options are a great thing. And there's all, it, you think about the continuous improvement or the technology or the supply chain management tool belt, Dell. There's lots of things in there. So very well yeah. said. All right. So let's do this. I bet if some of our folks tuned in to a great interview we had with uh, Mike Skinner, your colleague at COLX Logistics, we had a lot of fun. He brought a lot to the table. And it's great to have you here. But for the folks that may have missed that first one or may not be paying attention to the movers and shakers out there in the industry, in a nutshell, what does COLX Logistics do, Dale? Yeah, well, you know, Scott, we're a, we're a global third-party logistics provider. We have specialized in transportation management systems, but we do, we have a core competency in managed services and obviously in supply chain consulting and continuous improvement and benchmarking. And we serve customers globally. Most of our customers are in the chemical industry and we have offices in the U.S. and in Europe now. Just opened a new office in Houston, by the way. Really? Yeah. Okay, I bet there's some disappointed Astros fans uh, down there in Houston. But Houston's was such a kidding aside. Houston's such a, an outstanding market. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're excited about it too. And you can find all kinds of delicious food dishes on your first visit down to Ooh. the new Houston branch, Dale. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Before I ask you about what makes the chemicals industry more unique than others, anything else you want to add about? Uh, as you were describing what CLX Logistics does. I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no. I think that's the, at the core, that's who we are. Yeah. So let's talk about the chemicals industry. And I know you all do a ton of work globally. And while you do a lot of work, as you mentioned, in the chemical space, you also do a lot of other work. And we've also established your background, mm-hmm. your highfalutin background, if I may, <laughs> highly technical term. So let's, let's, in your view, what makes the chemicals industry? If you were speaking to a room full of folks that never had, you know, set foot in the chemical space, what makes it so m- more unique than many other sectors in the, in the in industry? Well, you know, Scott, one of the unique aspects of the chemical industry is it touches everybody. There's no de- denying that even though you're not buying a, a drum of chemicals, your life is impacted significantly by the chemical industry, from packaging to health to food on the table to your home. It's all being impacted by the chemical network, chemical manufacturing network. And another thing that makes it unique is that chemical manufacturing network in the U.S. is core to the financial health of our economy. And third way that it's unique is in transportation of the cargo itself. You know, in our world, we may talk to customer one about handling a cargo of, you know, rocket fuel and how to safely transport it. What's the the costs involved and how, what to expect in terms of service and hang up the phone and talk to another customer about uh, a coating that's coated on under coats ships that's completely different. And then another customer, we might be talking about tomato sauce. (laughs) <laughs> so, it's really a unique industry from that standpoint. Well, you can you can solve a lot of the world's ills between rocket fuel and tomato sauce. Just saying, <laughs> Dale. And it's also so funny. You know, a lot of folks talk about rocket fuel, whether they're referencing the book or they're referencing, um, you know, what's behind growth or whatever. You're literally talking about moving rocket fuel. That is yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. No, no jokes. <laughs> One of the things I've kind of picked up from previous conversations is the special tanks that are involved due to global standards when you're moving stuff like rocket fuel. Mm-hmm. And I, when I was on y'all's website the other day, I came across y'all offer a, like an ISO tank capacity guide right. over at clxlogistics.com that a m- bunch of folks may find helpful. 
So do you, do you feel like a big part of y'all's role is educating not just your customers, but really the market? Yeah, absolutely. The cross-pollination of knowledge is something that is a core competency for us. You know, some customers may be getting into a new market with their products and don't quite understand what's required or how to safely or even how to budget for the transportation part. We're, we're there to help. Other customers may be just the opposite. They've been doing this for a long time. They have a lot of experience and they're looking at how do we improve? How do we make it better? And so, yeah, it's this best way to describe it is, you know, cross pollination of knowledge and, and learning. I love that. One of the phrases that comes to my mind as you shared that, and I can't remember who shared this with me, but uninformed people make uninformed decisions. And that's when you really can get in trouble as an organization. Yeah. All right, I want to ask you something else about the CLX kind of portfolio of things y'all do. Mm-hmm. Tell me about Lane Logics. What does the CLX Lane Logics do? Yeah, Lane Logics is a program that we offer clients that combines rate and service benchmarking with procurement and how to buy transportation procurement. You know, if you think of a benchmark, it's knowing the answers to the test before you go to the market. And in procurement, it's how do you buy using best practices. But then a third step is, okay, after you got the new contracts and implemented, how do you make sure that you're using the new contracts and you're leveraging all the benefits you got from that procurement event throughout the year? Hmm. Things change. Customers are added. Customers are taken away. Volumes change. And as that's happening, this is a continuous look at, okay, here's a lane that's tripled in volume. It didn't have enough volume to be contracted in the beginning, but it's a long haul. And uh, now it's a very expensive lane if you're paying tariff or rates for that. Mm. So being able to tell the client, hey, you've, you've got an opportunity here to save some money on contracting this lane. You don't have to take everything out. So it's that continuous cycle of execution, buying, measuring yourself to the market process that really defines is at the heart of lane logics. Dale, I I appreciate you sharing that uh, about all the different advantages that lane logics brings to the table from the team at CLX. And one of the things that you mentioned, two two of the things in particular you mentioned that speak to me is not only the ability to save money through the benchmarking and procurement tools and, and expertise or whatever, but it helps create a better and easier day for the people out there that are in the seats, that are in the trenches. Do you see that time and time again? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's so yeah. important. I mean, we, yeah. we need to make as much as we can leadership across organizations. We've got to put them in our people in position to win and succeed and overcome all these challenges we were talking about a little earlier, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's a lot of change management that goes into helping our customers understand how to do things better, not only cheaper, but also more efficiently. Right. And I like how you put it with benchmarking, knowing the answers before you get in to have to take the test. Yeah. I really wish I had a lot of that in earlier my (laughs) academic career. Maybe I could have done a biochemical engineering. Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. (laughs) Wasn't in the cards for me. Okay. I want to, if we can, based on what you shared about Lane Logics, I want to get into just a couple of examples in terms of where you've seen it really make powerful, done some powerful things for some of your customers. Can you share a story or two? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, one story, we were doing a Lane Logics uh, benchmarking event and we were looking at line haul and accessorial charges and we noticed the ratio of accessorial to total cost was way off. Mm for this client. And when we started getting into the data and looking, we found that there was a provider, a series of providers that was charging them an address change fee to the tune of like twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month. Wow. And they knew where to go, but the address, the customer address in SAP, several addresses were wrong. So they kept charging them these fees and not telling them. So that was that was an aha moment for the client and, and for us as well. And uh, first we thought it was a glitch in the data, but then, you know, the more we looked, the more we saw it was real. That was one example of lane logics. The other 
example, Lane Logics is not necessarily cost savings, but knowing what you're paying for the service you're getting. So a very specialty chemical company who were at the top of the top of the scale in terms of cost. But that was a differentiator for them from their competitors is the ability to offer expedited shipments, rush shipments. And so when we showed him that, we said, this isn't a bad thing. Based on your business model, this is just the reality of your business model, the cost of operating this way. And so for them, it was good to see what the cost of service was for them and to make a rational decision based on that. So $30,000 a month, going back to your first example, (laughs) off a needless address change fee. I bet you made the team, but the CFO's day in particular. And then secondly, and probably, if not more powerful than the savings, is what I heard you share there in that second example, allowing for teams and leaders and managers to be in the know so they know their business better, they make yeah. better decisions, and ultimately they can optimize service levels and give their customers options. That's, that's some powerful rocket fuel in my book. Yeah, Exactly. And it's all about these findings are are based on the data and the information. So when you bring something like we, you're, there's really something broken here and here's the data to prove it. It's really important from a confidence level for the client that they're able to see that data and truly understand that this isn't conjectural. This is like, this is based on fact. Here are the facts. Here are the invoices. And uh, that really helps in the change management and the emotion part to what you're dealing with here. Well, people work hard and and then generally people are very smart, but asking them to change or do something different without data is pretty dangerous. Agreed. So what you're saying is you can take it to the bank. It's rooted in data. It's not gut or instinct or hunches or assumptions, but you can take it to the bank and lean on it. I love that. Because the other thing that we've talked a ton about in recent years is when you can truly depend on the information and the data you're getting and knowing that it's rooted there in the numbers, you can make not only better decisions, but more confident decisions quicker. And that is so powerful on a variety of different levels. It's truly a force multiplier when you're trying to maximize the performance of any team, but certainly your your supply chain organization. All right. So I want to shift gears here. We were just talking about some of the teams that you and, and the CLX Logistics team has been helping. Uh, this year, a uh, variety of places from a geography standpoint, a variety of sectors, of course, a lot in the chemicals industry. But when you think about and reflect on the year that 2023 was, goodness gracious, what is one eureka moment that you might have had, especially as it pertains to leadership or innovation? Yeah. Yeah. We work a lot with descriptive analytics with customers, which is looking at historical data. And then in predicting it, predictive analytics is what it sounds like, forecasting and everything. And the aha moment was the need to understand and work with probability when you're talking about the future. This is going to happen and there's an 85% probability that it's going to happen, not 100%. So the aha moment was for us was explaining that our predictions in the context of probability with the customers and having them understand that aspect of, of this forecasting system. And oddly enough, what the, you talk about probability, man, every time 63% goes up, what do you do with a 63% probability that this is going to happen? And so having worked through that, the post aha moment is, okay, how do we deal with the 63% probability? What do we tell customers? You're thoughts bring a lot of thoughts to my mind. And I think one of them is, despite what everyone's saying, no one truly knows with 100% certainty what the future holds, whether in the micro or the macro. So that's where these data-driven probability conversations are are so important. And then the second thought that comes to my mind, Dale, is I want you to accompany me on my next visit to Las Vegas. And (laughs) I want to... (laughs) <laughs> Apply your smarts and your probability, your data-driven probability to my poor betting. All right. Good stuff. I love it. So let's also, speaking of the future, 
We're going to blink in just a moment, and it's going to be 2024. Yeah. It's amazing. This phrase that I've said a thousand times goes something like, the days are long, but the years are short. And I bet a lot of our a lot of parents out there or practitioners can probably relate to that. So when you think about 2024, Dale, what is one bold prediction in global supply chain that your crystal ball, which I bet is more accurate than many others, what's it telling you? I'll, I'll start it off with a warning. And uh, that warning would be, beware the bullwhip. Okay. Uh, bullwhip has haunted us as supply chain professionals ever since somebody named it bullwhip. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> knew it. Somebody put a name in it, process behind it. But the bullwhip now, we saw what happened to the transportation in- industry uh, when COVID hit. And so as a community, we demonstrated the capability of creating a giant bullwhip. And no, I don't think that is going to be, re- that level is going to be repeated in 2024. There could be a pretty good possibility as inventories, somebody realized a lot of industries realize their inventories are too low, that we create another bullwhip in transportation industry. And one thing, A bold prediction is don't expect to pay next year what you're paying this year for transportation. Mm. So buyer beware. It's going to be a different market in the months ahead. Dale, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying stock up on toilet paper, but I'm saying beware of how quickly we can snap back in the industry and the repercussions that could have on spend. Dale, well said. One thought that that kind of brings to my mind is after all we've been through in recent years, right, especially the pandemic, right? Because the pandemic was probably a once in a lifetime, hopefully, goodness knows, yeah. experience for all of us. So many of us as humans really were just hoping and praying that once you get into the post pandemic environment, everything would go back to what it was, what it has been, or what the good old days, for lack of a better phrase. But that's just not the case. And mm-hmm. I think. What you're speaking to there is whatever shred of normalcy that you may have, you and your organizations may have found today, it's not permanent. And we've got to bake that mindset and that that truth into how we're planning for the months and the years ahead. Would you agree, Dale? Yeah, yeah. If you're not planning for change, then you're going to fail. Without a doubt, 100% probability on that. I really appreciate your perspective. And one of my favorite things I like talking about, especially for our listeners that may still be in school, right? And they're still kind of figuring out this global supply chain world is I think you're a good testimony to that. Our global supply chain industry needs people from all walks of life, whether they're from high biochemical engineering, right? Highly technical or whether they're artists, whether they're communicators, whatever. And, that's how the industry is going to be better and, and be better prepared for the change and the dis- disruption that certainly lies ahead. Would you agree with that, Dale? Absolutely. 100%. It, it takes the, the collaboration of people and the combination of different skills and aptitudes creates the strength. Mm. You, know, you don't get superpowers from an, all, the, all a group of chemical engineers sitting in a room trying to solve out problems, you know? Because they, they only look at things in an analytical way. But when you sit back and you bring in, actually did this for Penn State, we okay. you know, brought in mathematicians, music majors, and together to start solving some problems. When you do that, and then these perspectives, you're just amazed at the ideas that come to the surface. And you know, it's real exciting stuff. So, yeah. yeah. Dale, it is. Next time we have you back, we're going to talk about your patent. We'll probably talk about brown beans and hopefully savory <laughs> cornbread, not sweet cornbread. But I'd love to learn more about, sounds like some real powerful experiments at Penn State with the power of diversity is kind of what I heard you exactly. uh, just speak to. Okay, Dale, I bet you're going to have some folks that want to sit down with you and talk about some of these topics we have worked through. Congrats again to your team over at CLX Logistics. Y'all have been on quite a roll helping groups and, and organizations and folks across the globe. How can folks connect with you and the CLX Logistics team? Yeah, yeah. They can head on over to clxlogistics.com and right on that front page is 
a way that you can reach out to us and you can get me on LinkedIn as well too. So send me a message on LinkedIn. I'll be good. Perfect. And folks, of course, we're going to include those two links in the show notes. So you want to click away and we're trying to make it really easy to connect with Dell and the team. And also check out all those resources I mentioned over at clxlogistics.com. Okay. Dell McClung, Vice President of Supply Chain Services at CLX Logistics. Dell, pleasure to get to know you here today. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I look forward to doing it again soon. All right, to our listeners, hopefully you enjoyed this episode as much as I have. I wish I had three or four more hours to spend with Dale because we had to talk. We got a lot more to talk about in supply chain, and I'd love to get his data-driven thoughts on who's going to win the big game at the end of the National Football League season. But we'll save that for another episode. Folks, take something. They'll drop a truckload of good stuff here today. Take something he talked about. Take something they're doing at CLX and put it in action. It's all about deeds, not words. Your team, your people, your customers, your suppliers will all be grateful and thankful that you did. So with that said, Scott Luton here from Supply Chain Now challenging you to do good, to give forward, and to be the change that's needed. And we'll see you next time right back here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at SupplyChainNow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts. And follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now.